By the end of the 19th century, the near north side and the rest of Columbus was enjoying phenomenal growth. But with the growth came challenges. The traffic around the train station had become unbearable, and Columbus needed an entrance to the city that made a statement. The architect for the new Union Station would be Daniel Burnham, known for his dazzling skyscrapers, among them the Flatiron in New York City and the Wyandotte Building downtown on Broad Street. Burnham had a grand vision for the station. By all accounts, it was a masterpiece. One of his major accomplishments was uh, being the chief engineer for the World's Columbian Exposition, the World's Fair that was held in 1893. And it was really coming out of that exposition that Americans started to look at cities differently. The whole city beautiful movement, the whole idea of civic architecture, civic space, art and artwork as part of architecture, a cohesive plan with many, many elements coming together, all were part of the city beautiful movement. Daniel Burnham brought a little bit of the Chicago World's Fair to Columbus by making grand architecture the centerpiece of the Union Station. Shops and restaurants lined High Street while the tracks were hidden underground. There were no more accidents, and Columbus had a grand entrance. If you look at High Street today in the vicinity of the convention center, it goes uphill right up to the convention center and then down again. But that's not a natural rise. That's a bridge. Now, a lot of people think the arcade along High Street was the station, but in fact, it wasn't. The station itself sat east of High Street kind of at an angle to line up with the railroad tracks. Well, what the arcade did, it gave Columbus finally a nice gateway into the city. And uh, previous to that, the second Union Station, there was no landscaping around it. It was all open tracks. So what they did by having the arcade there is they essentially covered up the railroad. I can remember going in there as a kid and just being awestruck at, at this, this structure, those high ceilings and all the marble and the granite. I knew a gentleman that shined shoes at Union Station and sent six kids to college, and that was his job. He was a shoe shine man right as you walked in. The railroad not only brought people to the neighborhood, it also brought raw supplies to the factories along the Olentangy River in the area that's known today as Harrison West. Many factories clung to the river shore. Capital City Products was one of the most memorable. This is Maurice Jackson reporting from the Control Center. Martha D. is taking Columbus by storm. Central Ohio is proud to welcome Martha D. Spread the good word. Spread golden fresh Dixie margarine on your bread. This is Martha D. Martha D. was Capital City's answer to Betty Crocker. In the late 1800s, two grocers, Dennis Kelly and Henry Perung, began manufacturing butterine, a predecessor of margarine, along with other food products. For decades, hundreds worked at the plant at the corner of Perry and First. Like other businesses in the area, Capital City products such as Dixie Margarine were distributed far beyond Columbus. But the byproducts stayed closer to home. Occasionally, some hard oil like a coconut oil would get dumped into the river. The power company had a, a substation downstream less than a half mile. And this stuff would plug our inlets up. And we had a group of guys who had a rowboat on the river. And they would row down the river and scoop this, this goop. We would have the neighbor women call and say, what are you making today? Because if you're doing that stinky oil and I can't hang my laundry out, I need to know that. Oh, some of our major customers were everyday grocery manufacturers that you still hear. Pillsbury, General Foods, Entenmann's. We did a lot of work at the Entenmann's Bakery. Keebler, uh, we did work with Campbell's Soup. Wendy's was one of our early customers. Dave Thomas actually came to the office at Capital City. We didn't know Dave, he didn't know any of us, but he told us he had an idea for these restaurants and he needed a source for vegetable oil, for his french fries. These busy factories brought opportunities and better paying jobs to the short north, but it also made the neighborhood a less desirable place to live. If you made enough money, you wanted to move away from the railroads and rendering plants and the automobile made it possible. Second generation Italians, Greeks, Poles, African Americans, and others left what had been an entry point neighborhood for the suburbs. <laughs> 